Hi everyone and welcome to another video. I'm Lorraine Macar and today I'm going to talk about what I did for the Invisible Cities project in April, which already feels like a very long time ago because in April the three countries were Vietnam, Equatorial Guinea and Peru. And uh, for this video I'm always grouping two countries and I haven't really done Peru yet, so that's very easy. So I'm going to talk now about my adventures with Vietnam and Equatorial Guinea. So for both of these countries I have already talked about the books in my uh, bi-monthly wrap-up, so you might have seen some of this. I try to talk about the books a little bit more, partially because I forgot what I said in said videos. Um, you will also see what I did food-wise and uh, for both countries I didn't watch a movie because I was in a little bit of a invisible cities well, slump is a big word, but I felt like I needed to not force myself to watch movies until now. The watching movies part is the part that has brought me the least because it takes a lot of time to find movies that, one, I'm interested in, two, that qualify, uh, and three, that I have access to. And with qualify, I mean, yes, you can find a lot of book uh, movies about Iran, uh, but usually they're Hollywoody movies made by Americans for Americans about Americans in Iran and that's not necessarily what I'm interested in um, So because of that I took a little bit of break on the movies So I didn't watch anything for both Vietnam and Equatorial Guinea and there are probably movies out there that would have fit those three uh, criteria, but It was just books and food for me so for Vietnam, I read the book uh, The Hemel Bove of Vietnam by Duan Tu Hong. This is in Dutch and it was translated from the French by Mani Karkar. And the French version, I do not know who translated that. Uh, but the French version was translated from the Vietnamese and in French the title is Au Zenith, which resembles the English title which is The Zenith. So it's a big book, it's a slow book. There are multiple parts. The first Third and fifth, if I remember correctly, uh, are about two old men. One is the president of Vietnam at the time, but he has been put on an island and um, he's been put into exile. So the mountain that he's been put on, I said island, I'm thinking of Napoleon. I meant mountain. Um, it's his prison. There are people that look after him, but they are his guards and he knows it. And while he is on that mountain, he reflects about his life, so he thinks about what got him to the mountain, so you got a little bit of the story why he is not in charge anymore, though I could have gotten a lot more from that, but he reflects also about his love for a woman and the children that they have because he doesn't know those children, and uh, about the death of that woman, and what happens is in the first part in the beginning is that he hears a young boy screaming because his father uh, has passed away. And that young boy and the father come from a village that is close by. And he's so torn by what it does to that boy that his father dies that that starts him reflecting, oh wait, I have a son. My son doesn't even know I'm his father. Uh, so he thinks about that. And um, he therefore becomes also interested in this village and what happens in the village. And what happens in that village um, is the subject of the second part of the book and that's the part that I prefer because it had a little bit more narrative, a little bit more drive. So in this village a wealthy older man uh, has decided to remarry and to remarry a very young woman and his son is not happy about that and his son, the, most, the main reason that his son is not happy about that is because the son was basically not working and just enjoying the fact that his father had wealth and had power and therefore got him money and power. He didn't have to work, uh, because, but because his father had a new wife and there was the threat of having a new child, there was a little bit of conflict there. And what I like most about that part is that it was told like it was a theater piece, so you would get a lot of the narrative you would understand because a village, the people from the village were talking about it, so there would be these long conversations between people that, without getting their names, it would just be um, conversation point after conversation point. So not blah blah said this and blah blah said that, but just people, person talking, person talking, person talking. And they would just talk about what was happening in the village and uh, what's the word? 
gossip about everything and I really liked uh, because you really get, got a feeling for the village because of this gossipy atmosphere um, so yeah I like that part um, and then so in the third part we go back again to the president and to his friend as well um, so his friend is also an old man who was also involved in the politics of Vietnam and we hear a little bit more about the politics side when that friend is reflecting about his past um, and he not only reflects about what he did for the politics but also about his relationship with his wife they have a very bad relationship and how that also influenced the relationship with his sons one is an adoptive son and the other is his biological son but he kind of hates his biological son and he sees how his biological son resembles his uncle a lot and that brings up a lot of things so there's a lot of reflecting when the president is is the topic of the book and when this friend of his is the topic of the book and initially that didn't really interest me because it wasn't going anywhere you just have two old men and I don't have anything against old men uh, but there wasn't any action there was a lot of reflection and not necessarily also any conclusions um, and I like things to have a point so that's where this book wasn't really for me but then with the fourth part is again another topic and then we follow the story of a man whose stepsister is the woman that the president falls in love with and has a child with and then when you put so the stories of the president and the his friend and the village and this this other person then you see that the the theme is oftentimes fatherhood and that made me appreciate the parts with the president and his friend a little bit more because it wasn't just two old men reflecting and not really having any conclusions but it was a lot more also a variation on a theme so that made me appreciate it a little bit more Overall, it was a little bit too big for me. Uh, like I said, the parts with the president and his friend weren't really my thing. The other two I was interested in a little bit more. But I'm glad I read it because it was on my TBR for a while and I got this from the library. Anyway, food-wise, so I decided after discovering that I'm not a very good cook because I don't really read recipes that I had to find easier things, so I just made a curry. Um, I had a delicious vegetarian curry with sweet potato and eggplant and um, zucchini and there was some tomato in there and beans. Um, usually when we make curry we don't add all of these ingredients, we kind of choose just a couple. So it was really nice to have this curry that was just a little bit more filling. I mean despite that it was a recipe that I kind of knew and that I could do rather easily, it's still was more than we usually do so that was very nice and we now also do we add more ingredients when we make a curry now and I always like also the the coconut milk aspect of a curry at least of the curries when we make a curry then um, I read a book for Equatorial Guinea and I read this uh, via script as an ebook and it was the book by, the, uh, by Night the Mountain Burns by Juan Tomas Avila Lorel so this was a book that I think if had, it had not been for Invisible Cities, first of all, I never would have discovered it. And second of all, I wonder if I wouldn't have DNF'd it because while I really appreciated it, it wasn't really my style. So it's written from the point of view of a young boy who lives on a very poor island in Equatorial Guinea. He talks about his life as a child in a very unstructured way. Uh, it has a very oral storytelling quality to it. So the way I described it in my last video, and I thought that was spot on. Well done me. Oh god, I hear myself saying this. Uh, but that it, it really read as if you are by the fire and your grandfather is talking about his childhood. Because it was it had kind of episodical quality to it. Like in the way that when you say something about your past, you usually reference a certain point. And then you talk about another thing from your past and sometimes that will reference what you initially said and sometimes it won't. And sometimes there are themes to when you're talking about your past and sometimes there aren't. So I really like that quality. But at the same time, I like it when things have a direction that you know there is a point. And this wasn't that. So for me this wasn't great. But 
again, I saw that they did good things. So what makes this life on the island special is that there are not a lot of men, first of all, especially in the family that this young boy is growing up. All of the men are from another island or went to another island. Um, so he has a lot of cousins and sisters and brothers, but we don't really know who is who. There are very little names that are called. And even his mother, he usually talk about the, the mothers. And he has a grandmother and a grandfather who is very mysterious, who just sits on the first floor of the house and just watches the ocean and that's it. He doesn't speak. He doesn't really interact with other people. Uh, so, And you never really learn what's what with him and why he is the way he is. And that's what, see, that, that's a good example of why I didn't really like the book because I would have wanted to find out why the grandfather is the way he is. And you do get elements, but you don't get an answer. Um, and you hear about what it's like to be poor also on the island because there are a poor family on an already poor island and what it means food-wise uh, that sometimes they only have cassava bread and not necessarily fish. You hear a lot, what I liked is was the um, fishing and kayaking atmosphere and what we learned about that, how uh, being on a boat is such an important part of life there, especially as a man, but if you are a boy who does not have a father, you will not learn that and therefore you will not learn how to fish. I really liked the sections that were about making these canoes uh, and how the whole island got together to transport a canoe over land. Uh, I really like that. Um, and there were a couple of, of stories of episodes that were, some were kind of hard to read. Um, and others were just funny is not the term, but maybe entertaining. Um, and most of the other people that I read this with, by the way, really loved it. So to be fair, the fair the point that it does not have a direction and therefore me not liking it is really a me thing. And if you like stories that are told in a different way, that have this oracle storytelling quality to it, you will absolutely love this because it is very well done. And once again, you get the impression that it's that it's an old man talking to you about his youth, and that was cool. Uh, what I also would have expected a little bit more from that book is also the impact from outside, so the Spaniards going to Equatorial Guinea. And you do get that, but you get that in a very subtle way. It are, there are other people coming to the island and stealing all the fish, but giving tobacco and stuff like that. And you do get that some women, somehow after having been on the boat, turn out to be pregnant and stuff like that. So it's very, it, it's not explicit. Nothing in this book is explicit, is ex explicit. And that is something that you should be aware of if you go into it, because you're gonna be disappointed. Food-wise, so I made a dessert. It had been a while since I made a dessert. I only made a snack earlier for, I can't even remember which country, so. <laughs> So there's that. Maybe I think it was Iran or Iraq. No, Iraq. I made I made a snack for, and this time so I decided to go to, for a dessert, which is called aquadu, and it is bananas that are peeled and then cut and put in the oven, and they have a very sweet mix that is added that the bananas can is soak into, and you also add coconut, uh, and the the mixture that you add, if I remember correctly, it had honey, it had lemon it was very sweet honestly we are big eaters so i had prepared two bananas each i think and it was way too much i mean we ate it of course but you took one bite it's like you felt your your teeth falling up for all the sweetness so if you have a sweet tooth i would definitely recommend this um we never really bake bananas so this was nice to do that um, will I make it again? No, I don't think so because we are not huge sweet tooth, sweet teeth. Are two people sweet teeth then? Uh, but it was really nice to try and I really like that this again. So for the past couple of recipes, because I've been doing more easier things, the recipes have been going well. <laughs> it's not that I make something and I'm like, ah, I don't think this is a thing. So that has been good. But at the same time, because I'm not asking too much of myself, I don't have that fulfillment when I make something 
new really because it's still a little bit too easy and too close to home so really I'm never going to be satisfied but to be fair uh, I was thinking of that for the rest of the invisible stitches I was kind of hesitating because I need to prioritize my things a little bit more and I so prioritizing also means doing other things less uh, to maybe drop the food part uh, but having myself make find a new recipe each week or so and then making it is one of the things that I've been really liking in the lockdown-ish situation and uh, not having a lot of possibilities to, for doing things. So I was making a list of what I'm going to do in May and while I was thinking of oh maybe I shouldn't do the food, like no, but this is one of the parts that I'm liking. So I'm looking forward to finding recipes for Madagascar and so I'm still gonna do Peru even though I'm late and I still also have to find a recipe for what's the other country? Romania and I'm kind of already listening to a book that is for the month of June so I'm already kind of in Barbados which is June even though I haven't done all of Peru yet which is April apart from that we are doing great Anyway, I think I've talked for long enough about <laughs> what I did for Invisible Cities in April. Uh, I'd love to hear about your experience with Invisible Cities or if you're reading around the world and if you've read any of these books. I know there are a lot of other books that you could have, I could have read for Vietnam. One of the books that I read last year was The Mountain Sings by Nguyen Phan Khe Mai, which I really liked, even though it's not for everybody. Um, but if you've read anything else from Equatorial Guinea, I would also love to hear what you've done. Um, because it's a country that you kind of forget exists, to be honest, which is bad. Anyway, thank you for watching. Bye!